sermon series today that I've called Modern Family Vintage Values. And when it comes to our family, we will all face modern challenges, no matter what our age, no matter what our family dynamics are. We all face tough questions nowadays. How, how do we raise our kids in a, in a culture that doesn't identify with the same values that I do, right? And that challenge holds true whether you're a parent or whether you're a grandparent or you're just someone who, who, who knows other people and is in a relationship with other people, who, who's exposed to other people in our, our broken, broken world. What is our role? I mean, how do we, how do we work through these new and challenging dynamics that the world is continually presenting us? And the reality is that we need to face these questions and, and, and these issues that are going on. We, we can't run and hide from them. And if we look at the, the brokenness of our society and our culture and the world around us, I would say it all goes back to the family. It all goes back to the family, either for the problem or the cure, actually. And so we ask ourselves, how do we become a more godly spouse? How do we become a, a more godly parent, a more godly grandparent, a more godly son, daughter, aunt, uncle, a more godly church member today? How do we become more Christ-like? Now, God's Word, of course, has timely wisdom and timeless wisdom, and we would be wise to seek and heed what it has to say. Wisdom and, and truth and insights and values for every aspect of life can be found in the Word of God. And today we're going to start looking at what it means to value love. Love. You're going to hear the word love an awful lot today. What does it mean to value love and to love those in our family and those around us? Because the bottom line is this. The foundation of our family and our relationship with Christ is love. Love from God, love to God, and then love to others, right? From God, to God, and then to others. But that to others part, huh? That can be tricky sometimes, right? You're all perfect at that, aren't you? No, uh -uh. The truth is that, that some people can be, at least occasionally, hard to love. Now, maybe when I say that, somebody comes to your mind, don't look at them! <laughs> Not now! <clears throat> so today we're going to look at what the Apostle Paul defines as love. <clears throat> this is a chapter that, that many of you undoubtedly have heard countless times at countless weddings you might have attended, right? Maybe it was read even at your very own wedding. But it's also a passage that I think is very, very relevant to us today and to our challenges that we experience in the world today. And Paul actually had many of the exact same challenges we have, and so he writes this to the Corinthian church, and tells them why they need to love well. So you can join me today if you want. We're going to be in 1 Corinthians 13, uh, pretty much exclusively. 1 Corinthians 13. If you don't know where that's in your Bible, you got Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. All right? And you got Acts and Romans. And then you got 1 Corinthians. And, and briefly, and this is a little off my script, but I, I say this usually when I talk about 1 Corinthians. 1st and 2nd Corinthians, for that matter. 1st and 2nd Corinthians, if we were to summarize them, it would be Paul saying, knuckleheads, knock it off. Okay? That's, if, you, if you tweet, that would be 1st Corinthians. Knuckleheads, knock it off. Because he's trying to correct them from some foolish things. And as I said, today we're going to dig into 1st Corinthians 13. There are Bibles below. There's a couple in the Welcome Center. You version on your phone or your iPad or whatever you've got. And I'm going to just read that for you here today. And I'm, gonna, I'm just going to read you all of 13 because it's too good to leave anything out. So my Bible says the way of love. And he says, this is Paul speaking. And he says, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. 
if I give away all that I have, and if I deliver my body up to be burned, but have not love, I've gained nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at the wrongdoing, but it rejoices at the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, and I thought like a child, and I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now, we see in a mirror dimly. But then, face to face, now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now, faith, hope, and love abide. These three, but the greatest of all of these is love. You've heard that before, right? Yeah, we, we, we hear that pretty frequently. It's a, a beautiful passage. Like I said, many of you probably had it at your own wedding. And as we dig into this passage today, I, I want to give you a little bit of context because context is often critical to our understanding of, of what a passage is trying to tell us. And in the previous chapter, right before this, Paul is talking about spiritual gifts. He says that each of us, when we come to Christ, each of us is, is given a spiritual gift. And he tells us then the importance of using that gift to edify the church and to build the church through your gifts. So if you are a, a follower of Christ, you have a spiritual gift, and, and maybe even more than one. And as we look at our passage today in verses 1 through 3, he'll, he'll mention a few of those gifts, right? He says, tongues and prophecy and gifts of faith. And Paul here is, is saying that in whatever gifting it is that you have, in whatever you do, do to build the church that you need to do it in love. And so when we think about our family and we think about those around us and, and in how to serve them and how we lead them and how we interact with our relationships, it needs to be founded in love. Inside your bulletins are some sermon notes. You're, you're welcome to fill those out or follow along as... For some of you, they're a helpful tool. But the first one there is simply this. Love has to be the motive. Love has to be the motive, right? And I know, for me at least, that can oftentimes be much easier said than done, right? It's hard to have that motive behind all of my actions. Let me give you an example, right? This past week, I realized a place that I didn't show love. I, I was making my son some food, right? And he likes to have the items separated. So for instance, if we make tacos, he will eat the taco shell, he will eat the taco meat, he will eat the cheese, he will eat the lettuce, he'll eat the tomatoes. But you don't put those together. Right? I Me, mean, I want to just make it easy. Like, like I, I, I'm a, a, you know, like a stew kind of cook. Like everything goes into one pot. Uh, that's, that's the way I like to cook as much as possible. It's just easier, easier cleanup, easier serving, all that kind of thing, right? So, so he wants it his way. He wants the, the stuff separated. And, and, and I want it to be simple to make. And, and so he and I end up clashing over this, and I end up frustrated over this, something so simple and, and frankly stupid to get angry and frustrated about. It's meaningless, right? What, what difference does it make? And yet, it still angers me. And in that moment, I realize I'm not showing love, right? He can have it how he wants it. Well, I look at what Paul says. If love is not the motive behind our actions, then our actions are useless. They're meaningless, Paul says, right? Our best efforts will fall flat. Look at what it says in verses 2 and 3. If I have faith, I can move mountains. But if I don't have love, then I'm nothing. If I give all that I possess to the poor, 
wow, generous. But if I give my body over to the flames, whoa. But if I do not have love, I've gained nothing. It would be meaningless, pointless, all for nothing without love. It doesn't matter how many games you drive your kids to. It doesn't matter how many nights you watch your grandchildren. It doesn't matter how or where or when you serve in the church or in the community. If it is not done with love, then it means nothing. If we don't do it with love, it means nothing. Why? Because people know. If you don't do it with love, we know. Your spouse knows. If you don't do it with love, your kids know. They see it, right? If you simply do things out of duty or obligation, they don't see love. And if that is what they see, if that is what the world sees, your actions, they mean nothing. So some of you might say, well, how do I do all these things in love then, Pastor? I mean, right? I, I, I'm so overworked. I'm, I'm so overloaded. I, I'm overwhelmed. I'm exhausted. I do all these things day in, day out. I got laundry. I got cooking. I got cleaning. I got driving. I got teaching, protecting. I got working. I got all this stuff going on. I have all this stuff. How can I do everything in love? And I would say the only way that your motive will be love and truthfully, we're not going to be perfect at this. None of us is going to be perfect at loving all the time, every time. But the only way your motive will be to love, to love our spouse, to love our neighbors, to love our family, is first to receive God's love. Each day learning and growing in and receiving God's love for you. Because you can do nothing without it. And, and it isn't just any old kind of love, right? You see, God isn't chintzy with His love. This is a, a radical love. We just talked about a Sunday. A love that goes to the cross. He wants to pour out and lavish His love on His children. For you, for me, for us. He wants to pour out His love for us. Each and every one of us. Hear me today. God loves you. Sometimes we need to be reminded of that. God loves you radically, wildly, more than you will ever know. You see, I understand. I think some of you are probably operating on fumes, right? You wonder why, why, why you don't do actions in love. And I know for myself personally, I know when my actions are not in love, it is because I haven't been receiving the love of God. And it's not because God is holding the back. Uh-uh, that's me. I haven't been letting Him be the Lord of my life. I haven't been connecting with Him. I've been shortchanging that relationship. And therefore, I haven't been getting recharged and refilled. And when you get empty, you've got nothing to give. Or at least nothing good. And I want to say for some of you, the whole idea of love, even, that God would love you, that can be a hard thing to grasp for some people because maybe you grew up in a home where there wasn't a whole lot of love, right? You never saw a lot of modeling of love. And you don't know exactly what that looks like for your life. Maybe you grew up in a home where, where love just was not the thing. And so, I don't know, maybe you, you wonder, is there any hope for me? Hear me now. If that happens to be you, I want you to know that God can heal any wound. God can heal any past. Whatever you have, whenever you have not received love, God loves you. And He will not take that love away. And all we have to do is reach out. Reach out to God. The God who wants to shower us with His love and remind us that He loves us. That He died for us. He loves us so much. He wants to show us His love. So may the motives behind your actions be love as God has modeled for us. The next section of verses here describes what love looks like. 
This is the thing that many of us remember or know in our hearts, frankly. It's a laundry list of love and what love looks like. Love is patient. Love is kind, right? Love does not envy. It does not boast and so on and so forth. And the first one there is patient, right? Or in other words, long-suffering. We don't like that word, do we? Suffering. Hmm. Life would be easier without suffering. Hmm. In this day and age, do we like to suffer? No. Suffering is no fun. I don't want to suffer, Pastor. Love is patient, though. Sometimes being patient will require suffering. Then, it says love is kind, right? I have to say in this day and age that it can sometimes be incredibly difficult to simply just be kind, right? If you doubt it, let me stick a video camera on your dash and drop you into rush hour traffic in the Twin Cities, right? We'll watch you navigate Twin Cities traffic. Yeah, buddy, I'll show you some kindness. I got your kindness right here. It's my horn and my bumper. Get out of my way. If you haven't lived in the Twin Cities, you don't know the rage that comes with every day sitting in traffic. And then it snows. <laughs> like this year, forever. We like to think we're kind. And yeah, sometimes we certainly are kind. But there are times and there are places where kindness just gets thrown out of the window, doesn't it? What's your trigger? What causes you to lose it? What if we began to think of all of our actions and all of our words simply in a kind manner? What if we were intentional about trying to be more kind? It says that we shouldn't envy, that we shouldn't boast, we shouldn't be proud. And what if we loved our, our spouses and our kids and our church members and our neighbors and those around us by, by not putting our agendas first? But instead, what if we adopted a, a posture of humility in our relationships? What would it look like to humbly put others first? To be kind. To not be proud. To not be boastful. Now, I'm not going to go through this whole long list because I know some of you are already going, Jesus, she's going to keep talking like this. It's going to be midnight before we're out of here. <laughs> I won't do that to you. But the thing I do want to encourage you to do, maybe later today, maybe tomorrow, maybe every day this week even, open up to 1 Corinthians. Read through this passage. Maybe, here's something that's really scary, but something that might be good to do. Maybe ask a, a family member or a friend, someone you trust. Look at these definitions and, and ask them, what is one way that I love you well? Right? But don't stop there. That's the easy question. Ask the second question, the harder question. Where could I love you better? Where could I, where can I improve? Where do I need to grow in my love for you? Now what I, I don't want you to miss in this list is what it represents. When I often do premarital counseling, I'll, I'll ask couples, if you were to summarize this whole list, what would your summary be? The truth is that all love is to be selfless. Love is selfless. And if you're looking at it, look at it. They are all, every single one of those things, about the other. It's not about us. Love is about the giving of ourselves to someone else. Yet, I want to say, and I'll readily admit, that I'm very guilty of this. We are all selfish people. When people don't love us, we don't love them. When people reject us, we reject them. When they don't satisfy our needs, we get rid of them. And our pursuit of love becomes all about satisfying our own personal needs. And Paul says it's to be the opposite. We need to seek first 
the genuine interests of others. And so in light of this list, I want to give you five kind of overarching principles, themes of what genuine love looks like. If you're taking notes, the first one is this. Genuine love takes the initiative. In other words, simply don't give up. Don't give up on the genuine pursuit of others. Take the initiative. In marriage, don't wait for your spouse to initiate. As grandparents, keep pursuing your grandkids. Keep loving your neighbors, even when you don't see a return on that investment. Initiate love so that they can have a chance to respond and know that they are loved. We need to take responsibility for our actions and initiate that. Just as God loved us first, we are to love others. Genuine love takes the initiative. God bottles that, doesn't he? Right? When we didn't know that we needed to be loved, God loved us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He loves us when we are broken. He loves us when we are hurting. He loves us when we don't even know that we need to return His love. Yet God initiates love anyhow, even though we don't deserve it. God takes the initiative. That is grace. That is beautiful. And that is love. Second one there is, genuine love overlooks the small stuff. How many of you have somebody in your life who just nitpicks every little thing in your life? Now, again, don't look at them. This is not the time. <laughs> no elbows. That's you, honey. But I want to say that we need to overlook the small stuff. And it becomes one of those things where you might win the battle, but you're going to lose the war if you're not careful. Folks, not everything is a hill to die on. We cannot nitpick our spouse. We cannot nitpick our children or our co-workers to death. We need to learn to overlook the small stuff. Yeah, I'm preaching to myself. The third principle of what genuine love is is that genuine love strives for reconciliation. In other words, with those whom we have disagreements, those who we have areas of contention and conflict, we need to seek to work them out. Strive to work them out. You may have someone who is distant from you. And whether or not you created that situation, as a Christian, you still need to take the steps. Even if they're beginning tiny little steps. But you need to begin to take the steps, make little efforts to reach out and try to reconcile, to do whatever you can within your abilities to show that you want reconciliation. But interestingly, I found this to be almost universally true as we get older. We have things in our past we don't really want to reconcile, do we? Right? We have things we choose to hold on to. We have things that we are intentionally hard-hearted about. People who have hurt us. Things they've said, things they have done. I'm going to hold on to that till I die. Well, I'm here to tell you. Don't choose to be hard-hearted. Far too often we choose the path of enmity and frustration. We hold on to those past harms. And the only person that it ends up harming is us. More often than not. We are the ones who get hurt when we hold on to anger. We are the ones who suffer and experience the pain. How often, oh, and it's so often, are you angry at somebody for a long time? They don't even know. They don't even know you're mad at them. I had no clue. What if God treated us like that, huh? Can you imagine that? God looking down from heaven and saying, Remember that time you did this to me? You remember that sin? We'd be in trouble, wouldn't we? Love like God loves. Love like God loves you. 
Genuine love strives for reconciliation and tries to build and rebuild relationships. The fourth one's a big one here. Genuine love readily confesses sin and readily gives forgiveness. I can't tell you how powerful it is for a parent or a grandparent or a sister or a son to say, I'm sorry, please forgive me. In fact, let's try that, all of us, right now. Will you try it with me? I'm sorry, please forgive me. Let's try it one more time because I think you need some practice again. <laughs> one more time, here we go. I'm sorry, please forgive me. Now you all can do it. I have proof. It's on video. <laughs> right? Parents, do you ever admit to your kids that you were wrong? That can be a powerful, powerful moment. We're not perfect. And we need to model for those around us confession, repentance, and asking for forgiveness. And when we... When we are the ones who break the relationship, as Christians, we need to confess our sin, our selfishness, our pride, our failures. And when we are the ones who have been sinned against, when we are the ones who have been harmed and hurt, we need to offer forgiveness. Genuine love is being able to say, I'm sorry. And genuine love readily gives forgiveness. That's the way God teaches. That's the way God does it. Well, the fifth one is this. Genuine love willingly endures hardship. Every couple, every family, every person will go through some difficult times. Those, those difficult times, those, those difficult things put, put stresses on all of our relationships. Financial strains, loss, and so forth. The, the repercussions of sin and whatever it might be. But if love is not the motive, then how will you make it? Sitting here today, where is your love tank at? Are you on empty? You may be half full. Maybe your tank is full. Praise the Lord. But there is... No way that you are going to be able to get beyond the hardship if you're running on empty, if God is not filling you with his love. And so looking at this list here in chapter 13, and looking at this passage, is your love selfless? Are you thinking of others more than yourself? Well, then Paul continues on to say that, when it comes to our spiritual gifts, even though they may be edifying or helpful, the reality is, Paul says, despite whatever you might do with these spiritual gifts, pretty much every action that you do with them, it's going to be forgotten. There's an encouraging thought today. Thanks, Pastor. So all the stuff you mean I'm doing and helping, and all this stuff is going to be forgotten, Pastor? Well, yeah, frankly, a lot of it will. So what will truly remain? When I think about my parents, right? When I think about their love for me, when I think about how my dad loved me, I can't remember every single time my dad showed me love. I can't even remember most of the times he showed me love, right? But he did. I can't remember every word, I can't remember every action, but I can remember he loved me. What I can remember is love. Those things that he did, all those timely words. He's, my dad's a great father. All the sacrifices he made. I don't remember most of them. But I do remember that he loved me. When you are truly loved, it leaves an imprint on us that we carry forever. That love endures. It's not because of a toy that you bought. It's not because maybe you bought this car that they always wanted. It's not because of a great vacation you took them on. It's not because of all those good things. Good things are good things. Those are great, fine, awesome, wonderful. But eventually, those will be gone and they won't remember. Truly, it's about love. If you doubt me, ask somebody what you gave them through Christmases ago. Good luck. 
Even though those things are great, they are temporary. Love is what they will remember. Because as Paul says, love never ends. In the, the last section here of chapter 13, 1 Corinthians, Paul encourages us and he challenges us that despite our ill attempts to love, despite our failures, Paul says there is still hope. There's hope for us. If you haven't loved perfectly, the good news, and I want you to hear this today, is there is still hope. He says in verse 8, love never ends, it never fails. As for prophecies, they're going to pass away. As for tongues, they're going to cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, and I thought like a child, and I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I gave up childish ways. In other words, love can grow. Paul says that we can mature in our love for others. Yet I think many of us would say, yeah, I, I certainly know of people that that's not been the case. There's people who have stunted their growth in love. People who haven't matured in their love for others. Do we want to be known as the people who put our wants first? Do we want to be known as the one who always has to have their way? It's one thing if my three-year-old throws a temper tantrum in the store. But when he's 13, no, better not happen. We have to grow in love. We need to be men and women who are growing in our capacity to love others. People who are willing to die to ourselves. Being willing to make sacrifices. Particularly sacrifices for those who don't yet know Christ. Who sacrificed for you? I mean, yeah, obviously. Jesus. But who has shown you sacrificial love? Who has done whatever it takes to love you well? The greatest example that I know of that I've seen firsthand in my own life is by my parents. When I was in elementary school, my mother went in for a, uh, a very routine dental procedure that ended up being anything but routine. You see, an infection got in through that dental work, into her body, into her heart, and it killed the muscles in part of her heart. That's a bad thing. Led to my mom having a couple of strokes, an artificial heart valve, and a long, long stay in a hospital when I was back in elementary school. Some really tough times for our family. See, my brother and I had to go live with my grandparents. My grandparents lived just down the street from my elementary school, so I could just walk to my elementary school because there was nobody home. And so we lived with my grandparents during the week, and on the weekends we would go and live with an aunt and uncle of my father's. They were my brother's godparents, and we would go and live with them because they had a couple of kids my age, and frankly, my grandparents, after five straight days of the two of us, needed a break. <laughs> it's true. And while all this was going on, in the meantime, my mother was in the hospital just trying to survive. She was trying to relearn things like what my name was. How to speak. How to make her hands move. How to walk. If you've experienced a stroke, you know what that's like. And while she was there doing that, my dad was doing everything he could just to keep moving forward. This was back in the early 80s. How many of you remember what interest rates were like back in the early 80s? Yeah? May we never see that again. My dad was doing everything he could, working like a maniac, every hour he possibly could to stay ahead of the mortgage to keep the house. The house we weren't even hardly living in. And when he wasn't at the house, he was at the hospital. It's not that he didn't want to see my brother or I, but mom needed him. So he was there for rehabs and doctor visits and everything else that goes on with it while working insane, insane hours. And he'd spend these countless hours there just loving her, supporting her, being there faithfully. And I didn't know it at the time, 
But my father was modeling for me, steadfast, unconditional, never going to give up, never going to end kind of love. And it took us a long time to recover from that, truly. And in some senses, we still bear some of the scars from that today. But never once was there ever a doubt that we were loved. Or that my parents loved each other for that matter. Through it all, there was love. And I couldn't begin to remember to tell you all the different ways we were showing love in that season of our lives. But I remember that we were loved. And that is what sticks with us. We can always grow in our love for others. And Paul finishes with why this is so important. And I'll finish with this. Verse 13. So now faith, hope, and love remain. But the greatest of these is love. We can have all the faith in the world. We can have all the hope in the world. But if love is not present, we have nothing. Love needs to be the foundation of all that we do. Our motives, our actions, our words. Love has to be behind it. And the only way possible that we are going to be able to do that is to be filled with God's love. No matter our age, we need to grow in love. So what do the people around you see as your motive? Do they see duty? Do they see just obligation? What do they see? And I know this is hard. It's not always easy to love others. And some people in particular are awfully hard to love sometimes. But the one thing it says early in this passage is this. If love is not behind it, if we don't do it in love, it's just as if we were standing there banging a cymbal. Ching, 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 ching. You ever listen to a cymbal all by itself for very long? It's not all by itself a very beautiful sound. Paul says, if that's how you appear, if you don't love, as a symbol or a, a banging gong, gong, remember the gong show? So thinking about this, what is your motive? What does the world see? What does your family see? What do they hear? Are you living in love? Do your actions truly speak of love. That's right.